Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed and refreshed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Second Corinthians 6, go quickly. Second Corinthians 6, we're going to wrap up our review tonight on the I Predict 2013. Now, I'm going to read off the key uh, parts of this I Predict that I'm zeroing in on with these scriptures to talk to us about in 2013. Aren't you glad God blessed us with a prophet of God in our life that uh, we can obviously glean from and learn from, and uh, he will speak to us as well. How many are ready for next Monday night? Wow. I can't wait. It's one of our best meetings of the year. It's, I think it's our best meeting of the year, actually. Uh, again, I predict 2013 from Mark Barclay, number one. You better be extremely keen, sharp, accurate in 2013, or you will be snared and you may never escape. Say, so I'm going to be keen in 2013. Tell somebody. Come on. Declare it by faith to somebody. I'm going to be very keen in 2013. Tell them. If you don't, you're going to be snared and you may never escape. You may never escape. Number two, everything is at stake. Everything. What do you mean? Physically, financially, spiritually, families. Everything's at stake. There will be an all-out attack against all that we are, the church, and all that we stand for. As Satan throws one of his last, very last tantrums. Now, don't look at that and get depressed and say, oh, my gosh, man, what's going to happen to us? We're going to be victorious, just like the church always has been. The church has always, the church has been under attack since the day of its birth. But the church, the true church, always overcomes. Yes. I like a better amen. amen. Number three, it'll be a year of manifestations. Yes. There will be a demonstration of darkness and a cloud of glory on the earth all at the same time. Everybody shout it out loud. Run to the glory. Shout it again. Run to the glory. You need to do that. You need to do that. How do we run to the glory? Get to God's house. Don't miss church. Get in his word. Seek his face. The Bible's clear about it. He wants us to be the glorious church he called us to be. Number four, we will begin to climb out of economic crisis only if the body of Christ will begin to tithe and worship God once again rather than seek and serve mammon. Time to remove the curse off our nation. Could I get an amen? Amen. Uh, number 29, just a reminder, I'm not saying this is us, but as we're talking about the, the church, focusing on the church here, many church people will fight to be dirty, live liberal, and excuse away their sin by declaring a twisted view of grace and a distorted interpretation of the gospel. I'm out after every one of them. In a good way, I'm after them, man. I'm after them to show them the truth. I, got countered, I get countered almost every day on Facebook now. Almost every day. I just share a scripture, tell the truth, and somebody comes along and says this or that. So, whoa, 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 wait a minute. But what about this scripture? What about this scripture? Come on. Time to stop being the sloppy agape, uh, loosey-goosey, uh, hey, I'm saved by grace, can do anything I want, church. That's not the true church. You're going to hurt your life. You're going you're gonna to let Satan take advantage of you. In Jesus' name, shake yourself, slap yourself, wake up. If you can't do it, have somebody do it for you. 30, God will vindicate those preachers and believers. If you did not add that in there, put that in there because he spoke that Thursday night when we saw this a couple weeks ago. When he declared this to his church, he said it should have been in there. God will vindicate those preachers and believers who refuse. They refuse to turn their ears away from the truth and to teach the unadulterated Bible. It may end up looking like the prophet of God against the false prophets 400 to one. Your part there is refuse to turn your ears away from the truth because Satan is on all out assault to get you to do it. My Bible says, ladies and gentlemen, that Satan goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He can't do it. He can't do it unless you let him. But the word says he seeks whom he may devour. So the question is, are you going to say, Rover, Rover, come on over? 
But we're doing that by our lifestyle, by our confession, and by our beliefs. I didn't say you're doing that. I said that's how we, by our, our lifestyle, our confession, our beliefs determines that. My Bible says you and I, he comes about, now let me back up, I didn't finish that statement. He comes about like a roaring lion. So what does that mean, Pastor? Like he just, he going to stand in front of me and roar and try to scare me? No, no. The roaring lion is the loudest voice heard in the jungle. Right. Loudest voice heard. And if you're not a predator of a lion per se, you're not that nervous. Well, I'm not a predator of Satan, praise God, because you know what? I know my rights in Jesus Christ. But the problem is, because his voice is the loudest, a lot of Christians listen to it. And the Bible says he comes as an angel of light. So he will try to be the dominant voice speaking into your life to do what? To devour you, to deceive you, to seduce you. This isn't knock on your door, I'm the devil, I'm shouting, I'm taking you down. This is him slyly trying to get in your life without you realizing it through deception and seduction. Wrong friends, wrong lifestyle, wrong habits, wrong things you're doing. I know it. I'll tell you what, man, I want to get this woman of God and my wife in this pulpit to preach as she was saying today. This ain't old. Are you? Let me back up. Are you, are you of the old school pastor? Yes, I am. Uh, if, you're calling this, if you're calling this old school, I'm of the old school because there is only one school. Right. Yes. And, been, and been a new, new covenant written. There's only one. I'm going to read you some new covenant verses. It says you and I are supposed to do something about keeping this garbage out of our life. And God will help us to do it. I said God will help us to do it. So he comes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, let me give you another one. All right. The Bible says we're not supposed to be ignorant of his schemes, his devices, his ways. You better not be ignorant of how Satan works. Well, I'm not. I'd know if he comes. Are you sure? Because I'll tell you what, man, I know a lot of believers, man, that are getting hooked up with people they shouldn't be hooked up, doing stuff they shouldn't do, and they think, oh, it's no big deal. Come on, man. Pastor, just legalistic, old school. Come on, man. It don't matter. I'll tell you what, you don't even, you're not even aware sometimes how Satan's trying to creep into your life if you're not careful. Don't ever think, I cannot be deceived by the devil. You can't if... You continue to live out your life as the true church. But the Bible says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Think soberly. Just think soberly. Say, with Jesus, I overcome. I'm not putting fear on you. I don't want you walking out of here fear. I don't want you to be fearful. All I'm saying is, if I'm stepping on your toes when we're preaching the word, then get them out of the way and get your life cleaned up. I'll tell you what, man. Uh, God has brought me back to so many of Lester Summerall's teachings. I'm feeding on these teachings like never before in my life right now. And I just know why he wanted me to do this. And all I keep hearing from Dr. Summerall is when right before he went to heaven, he said, we're entering into the greatest day of church history ever. This is a day that Christians must learn how to combat the days, the works of evil and overcome them. And all through these teachings, he says over and over and over again, get your life clean. Get your house clean. Get the junk of the world out. Keep it out. It's not legalistic. It's not bondage. It's dirty. It will infiltrate your life. It's Satan trying to get an inroad to deceive you and mislead you and, and take you astray. Could I get a better amen? amen. And I kept hearing, he preaches it over and over again. These, and, these, uh, and this is a guy who had a lot of revelation about Satan and how he works. Because God used him in this area and he, he literally set thousands of people free. No exaggeration of demonic powers and demonic possession. And he said, you got to keep your life holy and you got to keep your life clean. If you don't, if you're going to live dirty, you're going to give place to the one who gives the dirt. And in Jesus name, we're to give him no place in our life. How much place am I supposed to give the devil? None. Say it, none. Second Corinthians chapter 6. And then that brings up another thought. I, I hear this quote the other day. Well, you know, come on. Uh, all Christians, we're not perfect. Everybody put something over Jesus Christ. I could not sit there and hear that statement and not respond. I didn't respond to them directly because it wasn't on my deal. But I posted the quote and I said, I am not going to brag on myself. I'm not bragging. But I'm going to tell you what. I ain't putting nothing above Jesus in my life. For this person to make a statement, oh, we're just, we're just humans and everybody puts something over Jesus Christ. Give me a break. Give me a break. And then I got to respond, well, you know, you might eat an Oreo cookie or something. We're not talking about eating a cookie. <laughs> we're, 
We're talking about having a God bigger than your God in your life. Like a better amen. Golly, man. It's just amazing. You just want to shake some of these people, you know. I, I, I want to do more than that, but I'm being generous tonight. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 9, 14. Do not be. Come on. Do not be. Let me back up. Let me back up. Look at me. Look at me. All right. So how are we going to make sure that we're going to walk out what, what God wants us in 2013? How are we going to make sure? One, we're going to be the church. Amen. Two, we're going to build the church. Tonight, I'm going I'm to go back and review quickly about being the church. And then we're going to talk about building the church. Because if you be the church and you build the church... I promise you, darkness ain't going to overtake it. Right. Oh, I'm part of the church. I'm born again. Let's read these verses. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. 6, 14. Do not be. That's a command. Christians don't even see commands in the Bible. We ain't got no commandments. Uh, who in the world taught you English? What school did you go to? Do not be. That's a command, folks. Do not be unequally yoked together with what? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness. What's lawlessness? The opposite of righteousness. What's righteousness? Doing what's right in the sight of God. So if I'm not doing what's right in the sight of God, I'm practicing lawlessness. I showed you in Matthew 24, Jesus said if you do that, your heart will grow cold. Grow cold. You won't even realize it. You won't even realize it. What communion has light with darkness? What accord or unity has Christ with Belial? That's a, that's a term for Satan. What part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God, you and me, with idols? Because you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. New Testament quote, here we go. Listen carefully. It applies to you. And it's a powerful thing for our life to help us to walk with God. God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, because of this, do what? Come out from among them. What in the world are we supposed to come out from among? The five things he just listed. Mm -hmm. What did he just list? Lawlessness, darkness, Satan himself, unbelievers, and idols. Well, how do you come out from an unbeliever? It simply means you don't fellowship with them. What do you mean fellowship? You don't go sin with them to try to win them to the Lord. Paul said, I became all things. That does not mean he sinned. What he actually means, because a lot of people use that verse. Well, Paul became all things to all men. Paul didn't say I went and sinned to win them to Christ. If you read the whole context, he said, I learned how to relate to every single individual that I came across. Because you can't talk to one person the same as another. If you talk to a Jew and try to win them to the Lord, that's a total different deal than trying to talk to a Muslim. And that's what Paul meant. You've got to recognize who you're talking to and how to address them to be able to help them know the truth. So he gives us this promise that he'll do what? Dwell in us and walk among us. If we come out of lawlessness, darkness, Satan himself, unbelievers, and idols. All right? What does he say again in verse 17? Come out from among them and be separate. Be what? Set apart. That's what separate means. It's not hard to figure out. Be set apart says who? Who said this? Your pastor is only saying what Jesus said. Yeah, my pastor, man, he's just too strict. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Why do you not want to be set apart from Satan? Why do you not want to be set apart from lawlessness? Why do you not want to be set apart from darkness? Why do you not want to be set apart from... I Why do you not want to be set apart from that stuff? You tell me one good thing. Lawlessness, darkness, Satan, unbelievers, or idols are going to do for you. Please tell me one good thing that's going to result in your life by you being hooked up with these things. Because I'll tell you your outcome. I'll tell you the end result. The Bible tells you. And it ain't good. But you walk with God, it's good. <laughs> I told some of the day, I said, you know, so the problem with the average believer is they hadn't learned what true fun in life is. They think fun is doing their hobby. They think fun is getting more money. They think fun is spending more money. They think fun is shopping. They think fun is going and buying more toys. They think fun is getting a faster car. They think fun is doing all this stuff. But fun is when you're submitted to God, you hear the Holy Spirit and the power of God's operating through your life and you lay hands on somebody and boom, they get delivered. And a demon comes out or a sickness leaves or all of a sudden a person is raised from the dead 
or a person gets born again or filled with the Holy Ghost, now you're going to learn what truth. Well, that sounds boring to me. Then we need to pray for your sweet salvation, darling, and get you back to the altar and get you right with God. Because there's something wrong with your heart if you don't understand how cool that stuff is. Can you say amen? He said, come out. Be separate. Do not touch. Excuse me. This is a New Testament. Well, it's an Old Testament quote. Paul's putting it back into the New Testament. God evidently wanted it there. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I just wonder, what do most modern day preachers do with that verse? I'll tell you, they don't preach it. 18, I will be a father to you. What a blessing. What a promise. Hey, God wants to be a father to you. I have a question. What does God not know? What does, he, what does he not know how to do? What does he not know how to fix in your life? What does he not know how to get rid of that's hurting your life? What does he not know how to get you out of that you may be bound by? Nothing. Nothing. Five of you know the answer. The rest of you are sound asleep. What does God not know about you and about life that he can't help free you, deliver you, or help you through in the name of Jesus, please tell me. What is it about God that he doesn't know about how to prosper you, bless you, direct your steps, lead you where you need? What is it about God that he doesn't know this stuff? But if he's not a father to you, you're not getting his advice. He's not fathering you. Well, it says he'll be a father. Yeah, he said, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord of hosts, if you do what? Verse 17. You can't read verse 18 and throw out verse 17, folks. Come out from among them. Be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will receive you and I will be a father to you. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. So then chapter 7, verse 1, which should have been chapter 6, verse 19, says, Therefore, because of what he just said, having these promises, beloved, let us, say that would be me, let us cleanse ourselves. From some, all. how much? All. all filthiness. Filthiness is contaminants. Yes. It's the Greek word. All that contaminates the flesh and the spirit. Watch this. And we are also, let us do what? We are also supposed to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, none of us are perfect. Darling, nobody said on the outside you are. You are on the inside. Yeah, yeah. What he said was, you keep working on perfecting holiness in the fear of God, in reverencing your God. If you'll perfect holiness, you keep working on that, I'll tell you what, God's going to be fathering you. Right. Could I get a better amen? amen? So, according to these verses, the term sons, and I told you this, sons and daughters, is not referring to children of God. Sometimes the term sons is used as a child of God. You have to look at the context. It's a word that has multiple meanings. So you got to look at the context is what it's referring to. There's times the Bible just talks about receiving Christ, you're a son or daughter of God. That's talking about a child. You're born again. But that's not what this is referring to. The definition here doesn't mean a child here. The defini definition here means son or daughter, one who's fathered by their heavenly father, not just born again. You got that? So here in this context, what does it take to be a son or daughter of God? You got to come out from among them. Be separate. Don't touch what's unclean. He'll father you. Now go quickly to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, shake your neighbor, say, don't get bored in Jesus' name. Don't do it. You better fight off old satanic boredom when it comes. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. I know I'm a pretty born preacher, but I do my best. 16. <laughs> I'm just teasing. 16, 13. Just making sure you're awake. 13, 16. Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I, excuse me, this is a very important phrase. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Jesus never said he was the son of God, ever. He said, I'm the son of man. What's that mean? He modeled to man sonship. You want to be a son or daughter? He modeled it. He showed us how to do it. <coughs> 14, excuse me. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. 15, yeah, but who do you say that I am? 16, Peter Simon, Simon Peter said, answered and said, you are the Christ. Two things. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Say, he's the Christ, he's the Christ. Son of the living God. Of the living God. Two God. things. You're the Christ because they are totally separate. Christ means you're the Messiah. You're the, you're the deliverer. You're the one that came to deliver us of our sin. In other words, to get us born again. 
Without the Messiah, without the forgiveness of sin, can't be born again. You are the Messiah, and you're also who? He didn't call him the Son of Man. You're the Son of the living God. Watch this. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but who revealed it? My Father who is where? And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on what? On what rock? The rev those two revelations of who he is. On this rock, I will do what? Build what? My church. And the gates of hell will? Number one, Jesus starts off in verse 13. I'm the son of man. I'm the model of sonship. I'm the model to man of sonship. And then he says, very clearly, Peter, you found out who I am. I'm the Christ. Who's the true church? Who's the true church? Because you can be a convert, born again, and not a part of the glorious church the Bible said he's coming back for. The glorious church, book of Ephesians, is a church full of the power and the presence of God. That's what it means. Put a smile on your face. Some of you look a little, little peaked tonight. <clears throat> Tell somebody it's a good word for you. You need to hear it. Get a hold of this revelation. Let's find out who this church is. Because ladies and gentlemen, I see people being defeated by the works of darkness. That's the gates of hell. That's the authority of Satan. I see some of the authority of Satan taking advantage of Christians' lives. They aren't defeating the works of Satan. The works of Satan, unfortunately, are defeating them. According to this verse, that should not be so. Well, that was just referring we go to heaven. No, it wasn't. Read on. Verse 19, and I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on, bind on, not in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in. Heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in. Heaven. He's saying, when I go to heaven, you'll have full authority then as my church, and you'll be able to exercise that authority. But I know believers that aren't. Yeah. They're believers. They're born again. Breaks my heart. So here's the key. Who's the true church? The true church are sons and daughters of God. What's it take to be a son or daughter of God? You've got to be called out from all the junk of the world. Meaning what? One, I've received him as my Messiah, my Savior, the deliverer of my soul. Two, I receive him as what? The Son of the living God. I walk in sonship as he did. I have a question. Did Jesus separate himself from the junk of this world? He modeled to us sonship. When you and I do that, guess what you do? You rise up as the glorious church. Now I have a question. If you're walking as that glorious church, you're set apart from this junk, correct? Correct. All this junk can be attributed back to who? Darkness, Satan, correct? Is it not hard to figure out the darkness is not going to get you if you're separated from it? How hard can this be to figure out? How in the world is darkness going to get you if, if you are walking as a son and daughter of God separated from that and God's fathering you? How's it going to get you? Tell somebody it can't. So this isn't rocket science, folks. And guess what? This is the true church. Say, time to be the true church. Time to be the, true church. the true church ain't a bunch of loosey-goosey, uh, you know, flat-out lazy, lukewarm, lethargic Christians who think that church isn't important, the Bible isn't important, doesn't matter how I live, no big deal. All these preachers make too much of this stuff. Number one, all of them don't. Very few are. Thank God more and more are. But I'm telling you, that a lot of the loose living church today is not the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Born again, I'll give them that if they know they know Jesus. But the true church is what? Walking in sonship. They're, following, they're, they're walking in Christ's example. How hard can it be? Go back to 2 Corinthians for a minute, chapter 5. You were just in chapter 6, so it should be pretty easy to find. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. How hard can it be to figure out what a Christian is? Do, do we really need a pastor to stand in a pulpit and keep defining for us what a Christian is? How, I mean, is it that difficult? I know, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not putting down your intelligence by any means. I, you know, I'm just kind of being, in a sense, kind of a little antagonistic with people that don't seem to get it. What's a Christian? Well, I live in America. I'm a Christian. Er, wrong. What's a Christian? Well, I pray to prayer. Er, wrong. What's a Christian? Well, maybe I ought to go find the word in the Bible. That would be a smart thing to do. Would it not? Yes. Hey, let's look at it. Go to the book of Acts. I feel like, I feel by the Holy Spirit, we need to go look at it. Book of Acts chapter 11. Come on. Book of Acts chapter 11. You may not have it underlined yet, so let's get it underlined. Book of Acts chapter 11, verse 24. Paul and Barnabas had gone to a city called Antioch. 
Watch this. Verse 24. This is speaking here of Barnabas. He was a good man. Say he was a good man. Amen. Watch this. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And he was also full of what? Faith. Now I'm going to tell you something. A good man, full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith. This boy must be set apart. Because I know a lot of Christians ain't set apart and they ain't full of the Holy Ghost and they ain't full of faith. They're being defeated. And a great many people were what? Added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Now Paul's there. So it, so it was, turn the page, Pastor. So it was that for a whole year, excuse me, for a whole year they assembled with the church. And they taught a great many people. Now, I have a question. Back up. If these guys were actually uh, good men, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, what do you think was going on? What do you think was going on? Anybody know what was going on? Hello? What were they sent out to do, Paul and Barnabas? Preach the gospel, hands on the sick, cast out demons. Where are they doing that? If you're full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith, don't you think you're going to come across some sick people? Yeah. Think they got healed? Yeah. Demon possessed people. Yeah. Think they got delivered? Yeah. If they were there for a whole year preaching the gospel in Antioch, what in the world do you think they were preaching? Ah, oh, you're saved by grace. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't matter how you live. Do whatever you want. Thank God you're going to heaven. The end of verse 26. And the disciples, say the disciples. disciples. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you need further proof, I can walk you through seven things the Bible says a disciple is. And it ain't lazy, and it ain't lethargic, and it ain't somebody who's lukewarm. Amen. And I can prove that from the Scriptures, Jesus' own words as to what a disciple is. Now, watch this. The disciples were first called what? It's the first time the term's ever been used in all the history of the Bible. They were first called Christians in Antioch. It's kind of cool because when you look up the word, hey, those are those little Christ followers. That's what the word means. They're those Christ followers. What do you mean? They're casting out demons out of people. They're laying hands on sick people. They're getting healed. They're preaching this gospel and people are getting saved. And we just read it. And all these people that claim, I'm a Christian. You casting out demons? Well, no. I'm a Christian. You witnessing? No, I ain't got time. I'm a Christian. You go to church? No, I don't have time. I'm a Christian, though. Really? According to the Bible? Amen. Or whose definition? Yes. Whose definition are we going by? Yeah. I'm telling you what. I don't still understand why anybody wouldn't want to emulate Christ and be like Him. The day comes that everybody in the church wakes up and says, Jesus is the coolest person to chase after and become like. I'll tell you what, your life will never be the same. That's right. Never be the same. I, I would challenge you to say, if you're wanting to become like anything other than Jesus Christ, I would sit down and write a list of all your favorite idols and who you idolize. In Jesus' name, may it be nobody but Jesus Christ. And ask yourself, why would I want to be like these people when I could be like Jesus? Why would I want to look like them when I can look like Him? Do what He did. John 14, 12. The works He did, I can do also. Why would I not want to do that? Not getting many men's tonight. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5. Come on. I'm already back there. You should have known discernment. Turn quickly. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love, I love these verses right here. Paul said the love of Christ compels us. That's a powerful word. You ought to circle that word compel. Put a little note in your Bible if you've got room to write in it. Write down, write down the word. Hopefully you'll get constraint or constrained. Constraint or constrained. The love of Christ constrains us? Yeah. Keeps us from doing what we shouldn't do. Keeps us from going where we shouldn't go. Keeps us from saying what we shouldn't say. It's a constraint on us. The love of Christ. Because we know how much He loves us and, and we love Him. That love constrains us from doing what we know we shouldn't do. That's what it means. The love of Christ constrains us because we do what? We judge thus. Oh, we're not supposed to judge. Who said? The Bible did. Let me help you with judgment for a minute. Since we're going down this little rabbit trail, and it'll be a good one to go to, because this is another problem we got. We're hearing all kinds of people say, don't, don't put that judgment off on me. I ain't putting no judgment off on you. Number one, the Bible says judge no man to condemnation. First and foremost, I'm not to ever look at you and say, I know equivocally, without a doubt, 100%, no doubt about it, you're going to be in hell. I don't know that. No one knows the heart of man except the man himself and God. You have no idea on their deathbed if they may not cry out to Jesus. 
Now, if they tell me they're a sinner, they're serving Satan, they, they don't love God, they don't like God at all, what I can say is if, everybody say if. if, if you don't turn your heart over to God, you will be damned and you're going to wind up separated from God forever. I don't know if that'll happen. Only you do. I don't know that. You can't ever look at somebody and say, hey, I know you're going to hell, man. Look at the way you're living. No, you don't know that. Guess what? All of you were headed there before Jesus came in your life. Tell somebody, thank God he did. Praise the Lord. One, judge nobody to condemnation. Two, judge not lest you be judged of the same thing. Don't look at the speck in your brother's eye when you got a plank in yours. Let me, let me define this for you from the, from the original text. All right? Here's what it means. Do not, judge, do not use your own judgment to judge somebody else. But you can certainly use this word to judge whether they're living right or not. Because the Bible also says, New Testament, that he who is spiritual judges all things. Well, I thought we weren't supposed to judge. He who is spiritual. What's spiritual? I'm not basing it on me and my flesh, what I think. I'm basing it on what the Word of God says. I'm not judging you because of what I think. You're smoking, you're going to hell. Do you know that? Do you know that smoking sends people to hell? Well, it's a sin. Is it unforgivable? You for sure? Has somebody smoking going to hell? Is that what the Bible said? Do we have that in the scriptures? <coughs> See, we're not to judge with our own interpretation of the Bible what we think. Right. That's what it means. Now you're actually trying to take out a speck in somebody else's eye because you're looking through your own means of viewing them, not the Word of God. Thus a plank is in yours. And you're trying to remove a speck because you're basing it on your own belief system, not the Word of God. Now, if I go to the Word of God, again, Book of Romans says, you and I who are spiritual are to judge all things. There's nothing wrong. I have a question for you. If we're not supposed to judge anybody at all, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? All right? Command from Jesus. If you see a brother in sin, go to them carefully. Why carefully? Got to be careful because you could get sucked into the same sin. Go to them carefully with the purpose of doing what? Pulling them out. Wait, 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 wait. Wouldn't that be judgment? According to everybody else it is. Hey, brother, you're living in sin. Whoa, you're judging me. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Am I according to the Bible? If I know for a fact what you're doing the Bible says is a sin, do you understand this now? If I know for a fact what the Bible says is a sin, I'm not judging you the way you say I am. I'm here to try to help you as another brother or sister in the Lord to pull you out of what's going to suck you in and take your life if you're not careful. How in the world can you go to another and sin, a brother or sister in the Lord, if you don't judge what they're doing is wrong? So you're not judging them. You're not saying you're going to hell. No, 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 no. You don't judge them to condemnation. You're judging what they're doing. You're judging how they're living based on what? The Word of God. If the Word says it's a sin, ladies and gentlemen, it's a sin. But don't try to make up your own little fence laws like the Pharisees did because the minute you get away from the Bible and try to judge somebody for what they're doing and you can't back it up with this, now you're doing what Jesus said not to do. Is that clear? Because you're going to get a lot of arguments about judging people when you just simply say, that'll hurt your life. Whoa, who are you to judge me? I ain't. The Bible did. I'm just trying to help you. Shout amen. Amen. Tell somebody, I hope you're not sinning, man. You're awful quiet. <laughs> Woo, wow. Felt kind of low, alone there for a minute, Lord. <laughs> Praise God. The love of God compels us that because we judge thus, that if one died, Jesus died for all, then all died. That simply means all needed salvation. Fif 15. And he, Jesus, died for who? Everybody. Say Everybody. everybody. Watch that those who live. Now, what is that referring to? Those who are born again. Do I have any born again people in this room? Let me see your hand if you're born again. All right. So we're about to talk about you. Take it to heart, please. Listen carefully, because now I'm talking about building the church. How do you how do you be the church? Separate yourself from this junk of this world. Rise up into what God called you to be. That's how you be the church. You do the works of Jesus. You walk in his example. You follow him as the example. But how do you build the church, pastor? First and foremost, verse 15, he died for all that those who live should know, should live no, should, oh, well, I can't read that. No longer, no longer, no longer, no longer. I don't think I can read it. Should I read it? Let me see all the hands. Everybody says I should read it. Let me see all the hands. Everybody says I shouldn't. 
And we're not a democracy church anyway. If you'd have raised your hand, I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> you do that though, right? Are you born again? Yes. Those who live are those who are born again. They should live no longer for themselves. Whoa, that's in the Bible, Pastor? Are you kidding me? Well, how am I supposed to do that? Why would he tell you if you couldn't do it? Right. Listen, if you understand how much God loves you and you love him, that love is going to constrain you to do this. Amen. We, should no, we should live no longer for themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a church. Excuse me, let me back up. We have Christians, a lukewarm church, a lethargic church as a whole on the earth today because they're living for them. The decisions they make about whether I go to church or not, read my Bible or not, pray or not, right. not as a duty because I love him and I enjoy spending time with him. I want to get, I want <clears throat> get in his presence, get in his word. I'm going to share the gospel, whether it's comfortable or not, because Jesus said to do it. And if I follow his example, he'll make me a fisherman. The reason most don't share the gospel, because they don't follow his example. And they make it hard on themselves. But when you follow Jesus' example, it ain't hard. And I've taught you many times, and we got many teachings on it. The only other reason we don't share the gospel is because we're living for it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. Jesus. Yeah, you just keep blessing me, Jesus, because you know it's all about me. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. I knew they'd get a smile on some of your faces the rest of you. The wood's wet. Man, we just cranky people need to pray for you. Wake you up something. For those of you listening by audio, your pastor just did a boogie-woogie dance. Praise the Lord. <laughs> say, it's not about me. It's not about me. Now, I know. See, people say, yeah, it is because he died for us. It is about you in that sense. Sure, man, he died to change it, get you out of the muck and mire. But not so that you would continue to live for yourself, but now live for him. Because if you're not living for him, you can't experience what he wants for your life. You can't walk in liberty from disease and sickness. You can't walk in liberty from stress and fear. You can't walk in the peace that he has for you if you're not following the peacemaker. If you're not following the healer, if you're not following the blesser, you can't experience what he wants for your life because you're, you're too focused on walking after you. So that would not be me. Not what are we talking about right now, Pastor? I'm talking about building the church. You're never going to build the church if it's about you. That's right. The reason the, the church as a whole is not building the church is because they're too focused on themselves. You're never going to build this church if it's about you. Because to build this church, are you ready for this? Oh, you're not going to like these words. Oh, I can see Andy just squinting right now. Are you sure you want this? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. God be willing to lay some things down. God be willing to give some things up. God be willing to do things God's way, not yours. God be willing, therefore, to change. Oh, change. You got to change. Yeah, change is good for the believer. I don't want to keep living in the old lifestyle. I want to walk in the new lifestyle. I want to walk in newness of life. How about you? How are you going to walk in newness of life if you keep saying, hearing, playing, and doing the same things you've always done as a, as a sinner? That ain't going to change you. Right? I'm telling you what. I, I pray in Jesus' name my church family gets this. Do you realize in the light of all eternity how short your life is on this earth? Do you have any idea? And people complain about being, oh, I'm church too long. I'm going to get out of here. Do you understand? When you get to heaven and look back, you're going to say, man, that was nothing. Yeah. You know what the Bible calls your life? You ready? You ready? Here it is. Ready? Don't miss it. That was it. That was your whole life right there on this earth. In the light of eternity, measure eternity. And let's put your little timeline in there of your life on earth. How much is it? The Bible calls it a whisper. Blink of an eye. But you know what this is? This is the coolest part of life, if you'll get this revelation. Because you'll never have another chance to heal a body, to deliver somebody from a, from a, a satanic attack. You'll never have another chance to lead somebody to the Lord. Never do it. When this thing's over, it's it. It's done. Right. You'll never get to experience ever again 
the joy of the Lord and seeing somebody come to Jesus, get them filled with the Holy Ghost, get them delivered from some satanic attack, get their body healed or raise them from the dead. You'll never get another chance. This is it. It's the only shot you got. Ladies and gentlemen, during a thousand year millennial reign, you ain't going to be doing another stuff. We're going to be ruining reigning for a thousand years. So all the stuff that we labored so hard to try to enjoy and to have in our life. Can you imagine how many people are going to go, and God said, I'm going to get to walk in it for a thousand years, and he's just going to give it to us. I didn't have to do nothing to get it. He's going to turn his kids loose and say, hey, better than Disneyland. Play, go, do whatever you want. Do you really think he'll do that? Yes, I do. Because he made this place for his kids to enjoy. And he's going to stick it right in Satan's face because he's going to be bound for that thousand years. And he's going to watch us rule and reign on this earth with Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't tell me that ain't going to be a blast. But you ain't going to save souls. You ain't going to heal the sick. Ain't going to be nobody. You ain't going to raise nobody from the dead. This is it, folks. God forbid that you all of a sudden get right on the doorstep of your grave if Jesus tarries. And you say, man, I didn't get to raise anybody from the dead. Man, I didn't get to lay hands on any sick person and see him get healed. Man, I didn't get to lead anybody to the Lord. Why? Who were you thinking about? Who were you chasing after? Right. Yeah, but that's just not me. I'm just not that bold of a person. Why don't you start praying Acts chapter 4 over your life every day? God will answer your prayer. Lord, give us more boldness that we may declare your word and go and lay hands on the sick, your hand and reach through us, and the power of God come and sign the wonders follow. Why don't you start praying that prayer every day? Amen. He'll answer it. Right. He did for me. I heard all these testimonies, people doing stuff in church. I said, God, it ain't fair. I want to see that stuff. I want to experience your power working through me. I want to help people get delivered. Amen. And boy, did he respond really quick. I'm telling you, folks, we're just praying the wrong prayers. I'm going to read it again. We should no long, live no longer what? What? For ourselves. For ourselves. But for yeah. him who died and rose again. Who are you living for, church? You ought to wake up every day and say, who am I living for today? Am I living for my little, my little fleshly little self? We're getting offended every time I say somebody, I just little, I feel hurt and I little feelings get hurt. Little, you're living for you, man. You're, you're bound. You don't even realize it. Once you get your eyes off of you. Well, if they quit offending me, stop looking at you and they won't offend you. You didn't hear what I just said. Oh, no, I'll still get offended. If you're looking at you, you will. Look to Jesus Christ. Look him straight in the face and let somebody say whatever they want and see how offended you get. You ain't going to be able to do it. Well, I don't know. You ought to hear what they say to me. Well, start praying in the Holy Ghost when they do it. Out loud. And see how offended you stay. Why would I do that? Build yourself up on your most holy faith and get rid of your stinking little fleshly offense. And now guess what? They ain't going to be able to offend you. You're a dead man. You're a dead woman. <gasps> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. The Bible says so. You can't offend a dead man. I've never gone to a single funeral. No, no offense. But I've never gone to a single funeral. I've never seen a single dead man offended by anything that's ever been said at their funeral. Not one time did I ever see him get offended. I've never seen him rise up and say, hey, that offends me. <laughs> never seen that. You seen that happen? The Bible says you died with Christ. Now act like it. I said, act like it. Can you say amen? amen? Ephesians 4. I got to quit. Alan's really challenging my preaching tonight, so. No, he's not. Ephesians 4. Come on. It's time to build the church. Number one, to build the church, guess what? You got to quit serving you. Write it down. We're to be the church and we're to build the church. You're not going to build a church if you're focused on you. You're not going to build a church if it's all about you. <clears throat> Say, it's not about me. God includes you. you it, you're, you're involved. But we're workers together with him. It ain't the other way around. Christians got this backwards. He's working with me. No, he ain't. I was said you're workers together with him. Not him working with you. 
Most Christians, oh yeah, God's working with me. What if you're doing something God don't want you to do? He's working with you? I don't think so. See, we go out and find, hey, uh, Jesus is a great example, true? Remember what Jesus said? I don't do anything. I said, I see the Father doing it. He's your example. He was a worker together with God. Give somebody a high five. Say, I hope you're still awake. Ephesians 4, 11. I know you know the verses. Let's build the church. If you start, hey, if you're building the church, you're not only being the church, but you're helping make it stronger and watch what it'll do for you. You will be victorious. This, this stuff will not defeat you. Verse 11, he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. What for? 12, for the equipping of the saints. Equipping of who? Stop. Wait a minute. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher are given to do what? Oh, no, 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 no. They're supposed to know when I'm sick and not feeling good and I'm whiny and they're supposed to just, you know, come rub me and stroke me and pat me and make me feel better. And... No, they're to equip you. I said they're to equip you. What I'm about to read to you, don't get mad. Don't get upset. Listen, I thank God for every sinner that will ever come to this church. My Bible says if they want to hear God, guess what? They'll hear us. If they want to know Him, they'll hear us. But the problem with the average church today is, is they've turned seeker friendly. We don't want to offend sinners. If you'd have gone to this church in this day and you would have been seeker friendly, you wanted your ear t ear ears tickled, you would have got offended. And I'll guarantee you many did. The design of the church was not to make sinners feel welcome. Excuse, let me back up. Sorry. The design of the church was not to make sinners feel comfortable in the church. It was to get them saved when they came in. But the design of the church, I'm reading it to you right now. It was to equip the saints to go and do the work of ministry. Because you go out there and win them to the Lord, they're going to want to come get equipped. Amen. Now, thank God, we welcome every sinner in this church that gives their life to Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And my Bible says if they want to know Him, they'll listen to what we have to say. We won't run them off. Right. I kept coming back. Even though I didn't know about tongues, even though I thought it was a bunch of drug addicts high in church, I kept coming back. You know why? Because I wanted to know God. Something kept bringing me back. Amen. If you want to know Him, you'll hear it. What is the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher supposed to do? Verse 12, equip the saints. Say, that's me. That's me. What are we equipping you for? Oh, so I can get a bigger car, bigger home, nicer clothes. Come on, I need more bling, man. No, we're equipping you for the work of ministry. Oh, there is that dirty, foul, four-letter word, work. Work. But work of the ministry really isn't work. Because when God's doing it, you're making no effort in it. You're just making yourself available. Amen. It's His ability that's making it happen. Amen. We're to do the work of ministry. Where do you think that's done? Where do you think the work of ministry is done? This predominantly is speaking of one thing. The word ministry here means to promote the cause of Christ. The word ministry. Promote the cause of Christ. You're being equipped here to go do what? To go out here and work at promoting the cause of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing outside the church. This is building the church. Watch. For the, what does this do? Edifying of the, the word edifying means to promote growth. To promote growth in the body of Christ. If you go out here as a representative of Jesus and promote the cause of Christ to people, you're going to get people born again. And that's going to do what? Promote growth to the body of Christ. Guess what you're doing? You're helping to build the church. Could I get an amen? amen. We're to do this till we all come to the unity of the faith. I have absolute job security. Because the body of Christ is never going to come completely to the unity of the faith until Jesus comes back. We're to do this until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God that's truly knowing Him as He's known to a perfect man in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, that ain't happening until He returns. So until He returns, how much of the work of the ministry are we supposed to be doing? We're to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. 14, that we, why, why, why are we supposed to be building this church? That we should no longer be children. Underline the word children. The word is napios in the Greek. It means an immature believer. You don't want to stay that way. Look what happens to children. They are tossed to and fro and they're carried about by what? Tell me. 
every wind of teaching by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Please don't think that just means religious teachings. Because 2 Timothy says, Satan will deceive and mislead Christians by doctrines that come from demons. Teachings that come from Satan. This isn't just referring to religious teachings included. But you're going to be tossed to and fro and carried about by what? Every wind, including demonic teachings. Well, I don't listen to Satanists. Oh, man, there's more demonic teaching coming through your television than anything you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. Trying to infiltrate your life and indoctrinate you to believe the lie. That's called doctrine, teaching. To try to condition you to believe that you're worthless, you're no good, you're sick. You're going to never get out of these types of sicknesses. And you're always going to battle with them. You're always going to, you'll never get out of poverty. You're never going to have enough. You're never going to make it. Never going to do it. I was just give up. So they would be, these immature Christians would be tossed to and fro by everyone in doctrine, every trick of men, the cunning, cunning crashes, the evil blood. 15. We're supposed to be speaking the truth in love. Yes. Well, you're not speaking the truth in love, Pastor. You're... What's the truth? The Bible. the Bible. If you love somebody and they're hurting their life, what do you do? Well, I don't tell them the truth. I don't want to offend them. Then you don't love them. Because you're going to let them hurt their life. Yep. If you speak the truth in love, you get bold about it. Not brass. No. Bold. Confident. I love you. I want to help you. I want to pull you out of this. This ain't good. Let me tell you what the Word says. It is amazing how many people come to me and they ask about this. And I say, well, this is what the Word says. And they get mad at me. They get offended. Well, you hurt my feelings. Oh, I'm just telling you what the Bible said. Well, you're not very nice. I'm not nice. I just told you what the Bible said. I'm just telling you. You asked for... You want instruction from the Bible. I'm telling you what the Bible said. What do you want me to say? Uh, evidently, you want me to stroke you, pat you. Huh? This ain't a petting zoo like Dr. Barclay says. You, you want me to tickle your itching ears? Huh? That ain't going to help you. That ain't going to free you. That ain't going to deliver you. Like a better amen. amen. Speaking the truth in love will do what? Grow up. Grow up. Into all things. Yeah. Everything God has for us. Amen. Into him, Jesus, who's the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, Jesus is the head, from whom the whole body, the whole body, the whole body, everybody, from whom the whole body is joined and knit together. How? How are we joined? Wait, if you're joined and knit together, how, how, how hard is it going to be for Satan to take you away? How hard is it going to be for him to isolate you and separate you? Very hard. But you get joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. I watch this all the time. I see people for 23 years, no, 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 no thought of anybody today. 23 years I've watched people get isolated in this church. Satan comes after the hinder parts, the ones he can isolate. Well, you're just not loving them enough, not caring about them. Man, we do everything we can to get them connected to the body. But if you don't do your part, if you don't get connected to the body, guess what? I got a word for you. You're not joined and knit together. And if you're not joined and knit together, you are open territory for the enemy. To isolate you and take it. It sounds like this. Nobody loves me. Alan, nobody loves me here. Nobody cares. They used to, but they don't anymore. Well, you used to serve. Now you don't. Hey, there's nobody loving in here. Pastor don't love me. He's harsh. He's mean, man. I used to think he was a great preacher, but now I don't know. Uh, you know them deacons. You know them ushers. They don't care about anybody. You know this church family. They never, they never call you. You'd think they know your life's in shambles. We never see you. How are we going to know? You know, if you were in church every service and all of a sudden you missed two or three, I guarantee you what, somebody's probably going to be calling you because they're like, whoa, what happened to them? Where are they at? But when your church attendance is sporadic and rare at best and you expect us to think something's wrong, I'll tell you what, what do you think in your mind of somebody who doesn't attend church regularly when they're not here? Oh, they're probably off doing what they, I guess, whatever they normally do. You're not thinking they're in trouble. Preaching pretty good, Pastor Baker. <laughs> We're joining knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working. That's powerful. Effective working means God's ability. Effective working. I mean, God's, He enables us. By which every, oh, you better underline it. By which every, every part. How many? Every part. Does it share? Are you pulling your load? Are you doing your share? I don't have time. 
Would you like me to go back to my other verse in Corinthians chapter 5? Who are you living for? For yourself? Number one excuse why I hear people can't go to church, do church, do church, serve in church, don't have time. Too busy. Okay. We love you. We're going to keep loving you. Keep praying for you. You just got added to my prayer list. Well, there you go. I want to get on pastor's prayer list. I'm going to do nothing. <laughs> that ain't help. Every part <laughs> does it share. Causes what? What does it cause? Look at that. Growth. Causes what? Growth. Two things happen. Growth of the body for the edifying of itself and love. Growth of the body is numerical again. Camera operators. Amen. Sound men. Worship team. Children's ministers. You know, all five of those people gave their life to the Lord. All happened because of children's ministers, nursery caregivers, ushers, greeters, leadership, deacons, worship team. Every part does its share. Guess what happens? The body grows. Amen. And it, it is edified of itself. In what? In what? Love. All right. You build yourself up in the love of God because now you're doing godly things. Are you ready? How do we build the church? Number one, get your focus off of you. Don't live for you, live for Jesus. Number two, promote the cause of Christ. Everywhere you go, write them down. Two, promote the cause of Christ. That's outside the church. Everywhere you go, man, you're an ambassador. You should be, a, you should be promoting his cause everywhere you go. Three, do your share in the church. Find your calling, find your ministry. I don't have one. No, you do. Yeah, you do. You sure do. Well... You know, I can run the camera, but I don't really want to. Well, we don't really want you doing what you don't want to do. But the Bible says whatever your hand finds to do, do it. And do it with all your might. Right. Well, you know, pastor, he, pastor, uh, you know, elder, uh, shepherd man of God. You just don't understand. See, my calling's higher than that. Oh. <laughs> we know how far that's going to go. I think Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, hi there, hi, high and holy one, uh, to, but to serve. And he proved it by doing one of the most menial tasks in their mind of their day by washing all of his disciples' feet. Now, if Jesus did that, let me help you. I can clean commodes, and believe it or not, I still do. I can clean floors. I can vacuum floors. I can run cameras. Uh, I'm back to doing a lot of stuff I did when I birthed this church in Granbury. I don't mind it at all. I love what I'm doing. Because it's all for the cause of Jesus Christ. So you and I got to do what? One, stop looking at you. Start living for Jesus. Two, promote the cause of Christ. Three, do your share in the body. Four, last one. Ready? Walk in love. Walk in love. I wish I had more time for this one. I'm out of time. I'll give you the notes on it. You've read the verses. Go to 1 Corinthians. Don't turn. Write it down. You look at it later this week. You go look at 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Because Paul said, man, even though I got the gift to prophesy but don't have love, I'm nothing. I got the faith to move mountains, and he meant it. But if I don't have love, it's worthless. I'm powerless. Amen. Now, let me help you. You're not going to help build the church if you're going to keep coming to church and not walking in love with other, with other people. I'm tired of hearing people tell me, I don't get along with this person. I don't like talking to this person. I like being around this person. Let me get some hands laid on you. Uh, cast off the oppressive demon that's trying to take advantage of your life. And you should start exercising love. Amen. Because without love, you're nothing. Absolutely. And that means Satan can ransack your life and take advantage. Right. We don't have to fall prey to the darkness. Right. And we're not going to. Amen. But walking in love means it covers a multitude of sins. You don't know how many times they wronged me. Well, even if they did it and it was intentional, it was a sin. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love doesn't expose it. Love covers it. I said love covers it. How do you walk in love? Let's, let's finish. I got to quit. How do you walk in love? That clock, man. How do you walk in love? <laughs> Bible says you must know God. You must know him. And be born of him. Here's how you get to know him. Walk in his example. I just quoted 1 John 3. You got to know him, you got to know him, and you got to obviously be born of him. You got to be born of God, and you got to know God. So focus on God, you get to know love. You get to know love, you can walk in love. But in the process, you know what you do? You start practicing what love does God. I'm going to give you the simplest way to walk in love. Ready? 
if you'll really get it, I'm serious, if you'll get it rooted in your spirit as a, as a revelation in your spirit, it'll revolutionize your life. Because when you walk in love, I promise you this, we're going to have a tough time getting you depressed. We're going to have a tough time taking your, power, your strength away. You know why most people are draining body? They ain't walking in love. You know why they ain't physically strong? They ain't walking in love. Brother Summerall said, I have a difficult time getting people to believe this, but he said, I can go. And pastor said it, man. Pastor said young ministers could not keep up with him in his 70s. They could not do it. He'd wear them out. But I'll tell you what, Lester Summerall, is as harsh and critical and straightforward as he sounded, was speaking the truth in love and walked in love and walked in the power of God, and the power of God kept his body strong. How you walk in love? Jesus said it. It's real simple. Golden rule. You do to others the way you want them to do to you. How do you want somebody to treat you? Well, the minute they start treating you that way, Pastor, I have no problem, man. I'll start, I'll start treating them back. That's called phileo. That's manly love. That's conditional. That ain't God's love. Unconditional says, don't care how you just treated me. And I have a, I have a challenge for you, and I'm wrapping up right here. Come on, we're done. Close your, head, close your eyes, bow your heads tonight. Do it. All across this room. Everybody streaming by internet. Anybody gets this teaching. You include this in the teaching, Megan. Anybody gets this teaching. Lord, you help us in the name of Jesus to recognize if we've got issues with anybody in this church, we are not going to walk carnal and fleshly. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, For where strife and envy remain, that we are carnal Christians. And carnal Christians, Paul said, cannot get off of the milk of the word. They cannot be fed the meat. They won't receive it. They'll never fully mature and grow. And Satan can take advantage of their life. I pray we get these verses in our spirit. May we go this week and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And may we go and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because if we're going to keep allowing envy and strife and these little divisions, these little, they're just stuff of our flesh. And that's why Paul said, I couldn't speak to you, 1 Corinthians 3, as spiritual people. I got to speak to you as carnal. There's stuff I'd like to tell you, but I can't. There's things I'd like to impart to you that'll grow you up, but I can't because you're still carnal. You're not able to receive it. You'd take it wrong. We don't realize, Lord, that when we don't walk in love, we're walking in immaturity, and you cannot, oh, this is powerful. You need to hear it. You cannot reveal in our life the things we need to know to truly develop and mature as a believer and become powerful in this earth, all because we're choosing to live a carnal life and obey our flesh instead of what our spirit says. Now, for anybody in this church, I pray, who hears this recording or sit in this room or streaming by Internet, if we've got issues with anybody in this church, I pray to God that we do not wait for somebody to come to us. I pray to God we humble ourselves. That we will humble ourselves unto our God and to His love and step out in faith and do what the Bible says and love one another and acknowledge one another, and respect each other, and treat each other the way we want to be treated. I pray for this in the name of Jesus. And we will become the most powerful force that we've ever been in our life, ever. But if we don't walk in love, we could literally have the faith to move literal mountains, because Paul did. But without love, it won't work. We've got to walk in the knowledge of God's love for us, and we've got to love one another. And it's not as hard as we think. Love works like faith. It has to be acted upon. It's in us. The Bible says it. Book of Romans chapter 5, that love was shed abroad, poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's in there. If we're not acting on it, we're letting it lie dormant. What a waste. What a horrible waste that many people in the body of Christ just keep focusing on themselves and allowing hurt and anger and things to build up inside their hearts that could really hurt their life. In the name of Jesus, we are the church, and we're going to continue to be the church in Jesus' name. Say, I am the church. I am the church. And I will continue, I will continue to, be to be the church, the glorious church, the glorious church. by setting myself, by setting myself apart, apart from the ways of this world. Of this world. I, will holiness. I will perfect holiness. I will keep out. I will the contaminants of the flesh and of the Spirit. As a child of God, I will not only be the church, I will build the church. I will get my focus, keep my focus on my God, not on me, 
I'm here to build His kingdom. Do His work every day in the name of Jesus. May I never make a decision about my life, what I'm doing or may do without first finding out what my Father says about it. If it's what He wants me to do. In Jesus' name. He will stay at the forefront of my life. As a child of God, I'm going to promote Jesus everywhere I go. I'm going to do my part in the body of Christ where God's positioned me in the local church. And as a child of God, I'm going to walk in love. That love's in me. Jesus' name. This concludes another message from the ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817 817- 491 0624